This episode of Outlines contains description of sexual assault and murder, which some people may find distressing. So, as always, listener discretion is advised. Today's Patreon-exclusive case starts with an episode of Crime Watch, aired in March of 1994. The episode begins with the presenter Nick Ross, his face serious as he looks towards the camera and says... Our first case this month is one of those bewildering crimes where it's hard to see a motive. It's difficult to imagine why anyone would want to cause the tragedy they did. After a little more preamble, the show switches away from the studio and the reenactment begins with the sounds of water and kids playing. We're at a swimming pool and about to meet 21-year-old Karen Hales from Ipswich in Suffolk and her 18-month-old daughter, Emily. With this, they set the scene for what happened between 4pm and 20 to 5 on Sunday the 21st of November 1993, while Karen and Emily were home alone at the house that she shared with her partner Peter on Lavenham Road in Ipswich. After the fact, the papers would lead with the headline, Mum, 21, murdered in front of child, and a devoted mum slain by maniac. There is a photograph of Karen's house, published in the Ipswich Star on November the 22nd, 1993. It's an end-of-terrace building, one of a small line of four attached houses, relatively modern, with a little path leading up to a red door. The front garden is just bare grass on either side of the path, and an ankle-height picket fence surrounding the area. In the photo, you can see that there is snow on the ground, though, according to the Suffolk Police website, it wasn't particularly cold that day, and nothing looks out of place or unusual, except for the yellow stripe of police tape which runs from the side of the house and all around the fence perimeter. In the Crime Watch reconstruction, Karen stands in the doorway of the house, holding Emily on her hip as she waves to Peter as he leaves for work. It was a little before 4pm on the Sunday afternoon, and as the episode follows Karen back into the house, the action becomes vague. She goes inside and starts cleaning, chatters with Emily a little, and then there is a noise from downstairs, and the reconstruction cuts away. He's tormented by the vision of what Karen's body looked like. Through being registered blind, I didn't couldn't see the details but he did and it torments him Mm. every night doesn't sleep very well Mm. he has flashbacks even after 25 years in the clip you can hear karen's mum geraldine it's taken from footage of the 25th anniversary appeal into her daughter's murder and she's talking about the impact that finding karen's body had on herself and graham karen's father It was just before 4.40pm, no more than 50 minutes after Karen and Emily had said goodbye to Peter as he left for work, when Geraldine and Graham called at the house. There were no signs of forced entry, and so they were alerted first to the smell of smoke, and then to the fact that the front door was unlocked. An article from Monday the 22nd of November says that Graham entered the house to find the kitchen on fire, a claim backed up a day later by other reports, but the Suffolk Police website gives no specifics of rooms, saying only, They were confronted with smoke and flames within the house, and found that Karen had been stabbed and an attempt made to set her alight. In the same room, thankfully unharmed and not yet affected by smoke, was 18-month-old Emily. Almost 30 years on from the crime, Emily is an adult herself now. She has a family of her own and remembers nothing of what happened that day. All she has are photographs of her mother and the things that others have told her about the kind of person she was and the kind of mother she was and would have been. In 2013, Emily told the BBC, There's never a day goes by that I don't think about her. I'm Jess Carter, and this is a Patreon-exclusive episode of the Outlines podcast.
Karen Jeanette Hales was born in July of 1972 to parents Graham and Geraldine. She grew up in Barham, just outside of Ipswich, and attended Claydon High School, about two miles away from her home. According to her high school teacher Derek Roberts, she was no trouble at all, and a relatively quiet girl. While at school, she met her partner, Emily's father Peter Ruffles, who recounted on Crime Watch how Karen had approached him quite openly and asked him out. He said, that's the kind of person she is. She'll come up to you and speak her mind. After leaving school, it wasn't long before Peter and Karen had their daughter Emily and began to settle into adult life. Peter found work as a fitter with Ipswich buses at their Constantine Road depot, and Karen worked part-time in Boots, the chemist being a part of Sainsbury's store on Hadley Road in Ipswich. The store is still there now, less than a mile and no more than a four minutes drive away from Lavenham Road, where Peter and Karen lived. After her death, her store manager, Matthew Hutchinson, told the Ipswich star, Karen was an extremely happy and outgoing person. In her short time at the new store, she made many friends and will be sadly missed. All who knew her seemed to describe Karen in a similar fashion. She was lovely, bubbly, she loved life and she enjoyed being a parent. I travelled up to Ipswich last week to research Karen's case. I've been lucky because all the Norfolk episodes I've worked on over the past few months have had newspaper archives which are accessible online, but I knew that with Karen's case I need to take a visit to Ipswich, my first time in an archive since just before the pandemic began, though as I threaded the microfilm onto its spool I felt as if no time at all had passed. I had two objectives in mind as I scrolled through the film. One was, of course, to find as much detail as I could about Karen's case, and the second was to learn more about Ipswich in 1993. It was claimed that there had been a spate of break-ins around Karen's area, and I wanted to see if anything had been reported on these. Unfortunately, I couldn't find anything, just a burglary in the nearby town of Woodbridge and a couple of street muggings in the month following Karen's murder. What I did find, though, surprised me. It started with an article from the same edition as the first reports into Karen's death and was reported under the headline Three Clues to Sex Attacker. As always, before I tell you about it, I want to be clear that I'm not saying that what happened to Karen was related, but I want you to understand more about the area and Ipswich at the time. The assault took place at 11.15 in the evening on Friday, November the 19th. It happened near the Nerdin and Peacock unit, apparently a cash and carry, on the Hadley Road Industrial Estate, less than a mile away from Lavenham Road, and 0.3 of a mile from the Sainsbury's where Karen worked. Before I go into details, I just want to say... Skip ahead a couple of minutes if this is going to be in any way triggering for you. The victim was an unnamed 23-year-old who was confronted by a white man of stocky build between 5 foot 5 and 5 foot 9 inches tall, wearing a manufactured balaclava of navy blue wool with tailored eye and mouth holes, a dark bomber jacket and white shoes. He first attacked the woman with what appeared to be a wooden cosh. She was then blindfolded, bound and gagged with three different items, a brown tartan scarf, a green chevron tie dotted with a small beige motif, and a green Horn Brothers scarf with a twin red stripe. The scarf bore the name Richardson and apparently had a £1 price tag affixed to it which led police to believe that it had probably been purchased at a car boot sale. After she was bound and gagged, the woman was subjected to a sustained sexual assault. After the man left the scene, the woman, who was still tied up, managed to dial 999 with her foot. Speaking about the attack in the papers, Detective Inspector Trevor Mason said, This was a sickening attack on a young woman who was working alone and we need to find the person responsible. 
Because this assault and Karen's murder happened so close together, the newspapers, in particular the Ipswich Star, ran a series of articles on how women could reduce the risk of violence towards themselves. Police revealed that in Ipswich over the first 10 months of 1993, there had been 20 reported rapes, of which three were deleted and four remained unsolved. As we know, though, the number of rapes which go unreported in any given year number somewhere between 60 and 80 per cent, meaning that in Ipswich in 1993, the real number of rapes and assaults was probably significantly higher than the 20 police were aware of. Under the subheading, Keep Safe on the Street, Suffolk Police Crime Prevention Officer Sergeant Liz Petman advised women that after dark it was important to stick to well-lit areas. She said, It's a good idea to carry an alarm and use it. And if a woman thought she was being followed, to make her way to a house with lights on, or to somewhere like a chip shop. The Star printed a bullet-pointed action plan to avoid trouble, telling its female readers, Prepare yourself. Plan journeys, avoid danger spots and tell someone where you are going. Look confident, walk tall, keep fit, be ready with your car or door keys. Walk with a sense of purpose, radiating non-vulnerability. Avoid risk, don't hitchhike, decline offers from strangers and don't enter unknown territory without having thought it through. Seemingly in direct response to what happened to Karen Hales, the advice for women while in their own homes was keep both your front and back door locked and make sure you have good home security, a spy hole on the front door or a chain. I don't know about other women, but I know that much of the advice printed in the papers is ingrained in me. I never walk anywhere late at night without my keys wedged between my knuckles. And at university, when I walked home from the pub alone in the dark, I would march down the centre of the pavement, remembering, look confident, don't look vulnerable. I remember a friend and I setting up a call service on her phone, so if ever she was in trouble on her way home, she could call the number and pretend to have a conversation with me, pre-recorded, to make it sound like she wasn't alone. It's a sad truth that women everywhere still have to do this, and that it is just part of how we plan our lives, always aware that we could find ourselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it's why this guidance does so little to actually keep women safe. We know it, we follow it, but as we see in the news now, as was the case in the past, it still doesn't make us safe. Since 1993, Ipswich has gone through its fair share of violent crime, drug problems and murders, some well publicised and others less so. A couple of episodes ago, I talked about Mandy Duncan, who vanished in the same year that Karen was murdered from the Red Light District, not too far from Karen's house. And in researching this episode, I found that in 2010 and 2011, a man named Phil Collins, formerly Phil Holland or Philip Treble, had been convicted for a series of stranger rapes, amongst other assaults on women in Ipswich and around Essex in the 1980s and early 1990s. It's suspected that he may have committed many more crimes than those he has been charged with. I can't find any information to suggest that the 1993 attack was ever solved, but it seems as if it was just one of many violent crimes committed against women in Ipswich in the early 90s and the articles published after the murder of Karen Hales certainly suggest that it was a town where women weren't always safe. We can't know whether or not Karen was usually aware of the possible dangers present around Ipswich, but it was reported on Crime Watch that the day before her murder, she and Emily were home alone that Saturday evening, and while she sat in the living room, she thought she heard a noise. She went to the front door, where she discovered someone trying the handle. She was too afraid to call out, but told Peter of the incident when he returned later that evening, and he reassured her that it was probably nothing. At the time, the couple thought that this could be to do with the break-ins that had happened in the area. But Karen's alarm at the incident makes what happened the next day even more confusing. 
Speaking on the 25th anniversary of her murder, Detective Superintendent Andy Smith told the gathered reporters, If I was to have a preferred hypothesis, it would be someone who knows Karen, knew of Karen, because this was a targeted attack. This is one of those strange unsolved cases you sometimes come across. The kind where, on the surface, it might seem obvious why an attack has occurred. If you hear of a crime like this happening in someone's own home, you think immediately of a burglary gone wrong. A hypothesis that could be backed up by the fact that there is no mention in any report of this being a sexually motivated crime. Karen seemed well liked and not obviously involved in anything liable to make her a target. Speaking on Crime Watch, John Saunders, the man leading the investigation, said, We don't really know what the motive was. As you can see, Karen was a loving, caring person. What we do know is that items were stolen from the house, so we cannot rule out the possibility that it was a burglary. It has been reported that despite the fact that there was no sign of forced entry at the house, Karen's purse was missing, as were what is vaguely termed as a few more items. Specifically, two of those were knives, described as Laser 7 kitchen knives. The knives were discovered missing when Karen's partner Peter returned to the house a few days after the murder with a couple of police officers. He noticed that they were no longer present in, the, in a wooden rack in the kitchen, with Chief Superintendent John Saunders telling the press that he believed they were present in the house before the murder, so obviously we cannot discount the possibility that one of them was used as the murder weapon. The weapon used to attack Karen has never been found, although there were reports from a week or so after the murder that a woman had called the police incident room hoping to talk to an officer about an object she had found, reported to be the knife, or knives. The incident room was unmanned at the time and, as it was out of their 8 to 8 office hours and not wishing to speak to an answering machine, the woman, who was in conversation with a man on her end of the line, did not leave any details. What she did say, though, was obviously enough to alert police to the possibility of her having made a genuine find. After my visit to the Suffolk archives, I drove across town to visit Karen's house on Lavenham Road. As always, before heading there, I'd spent a little time on Google Street View getting the location accurate. Karen's house is a funny one, because it sits just off of a cul-de-sac which forms part of Lavenham Road with the houses in two split terraced lines, accessible by a footpath which runs along the top of a wide green. As always, I'll pop the photos up on Instagram. None are particularly groundbreaking, though, I'm afraid. When I visit a place I don't know and I'm solo, I'm always a little more wary than if I had someone else there, even in the middle of the day. We know that whoever killed and set fire to Karen exited through the front door of the house, because there were no footprints in the snow out back. Around 4.30pm that afternoon, there were a series of sightings of a man in a parka with grey fur trim on his hood. He was spotted first by two locals who were taking a shortcut when they saw a man walking quickly and hunched over away from Lavenham Road. From there, he was seen again on London Road, which runs parallel to the top part of Lavenham Road when a couple spotted him appearing agitated on the central reservation. The woman in the car told Crime Watch that she thought he seemed suicidal as he darted out right in front of their vehicle. She managed to give a description of the man. Slim build, dark, short hair, around 20 to 25 years old. Not long after this, another sighting occurred in Chantry Park, not far from where he'd been spotted on London Road. This final sighting was made by a woman walking her dog who had just left the car park when she spotted a person running bent over in the distance. She paid attention to him because he seemed to be acting strangely and again noted that he was wearing a parka coat with a hood and was aged between 20 to 30. While it has never been established for definite that this man was involved in Karen's murder, 
He's also never come forward or been traced, and he had to have been acting relatively out of the ordinary in order to attract the attention of three different sets of people in such a short space of time. Just ten minutes after he was seen in the park, Karen's parents would find their daughter's body. Graham immediately worked to extinguish the fire, and the couple called 999, where it didn't take long for the firefighters to arrive. Despite this, by that point, Geraldine says that Graham had already put out the fire, and they were disappointed to note that the firemen who worked to secure the area weren't operating in an organised fashion, and to the Hales, it seemed as if they could be destroying key evidence. We know that police took samples at the scene, including from vomit found on Karen's body, which was tested in the early 2000s, although, unfortunately, the only DNA discovered was that of Karen herself, although police can't be certain if it came from her or from cross-contamination with her blood. Since 1993, a couple of people have been questioned in relation to her murder, both in January of 1994. The first was a man in his 20s who was arrested but released three days later without charge. The second man, aged 30, was arrested four days after the release of the first, but he was let go the following day. Except for these two men, I can't find any more mention of suspects, and no one has ever been charged with Karen's murder. There are certain things which strike me as strange about what happened to Karen. The first is that attempt to turn her door handle the previous evening. There's no reason for it. Perhaps it was just kids messing around, or perhaps it was something more sinister. The second thing which strikes me is that whoever attacked Karen was probably watching the house and saw Peter leave for work. The timing on their part seems way too fortuitous otherwise. Also, there is the fact that there was no visible forced entry, so either her killer knocked on the door and took her by surprise when she opened it, or they knew each other and Karen invited him in. If that is the case, then what happened? If the killer stabbed Karen with knives taken from her kitchen, then it wasn't a premeditated attack, and so then... What was the motive? He wasn't panicked as such because he had the awareness to start a fire. And if burglary wasn't the motive, as it seems it may not have been, then he also had the awareness to take her purse to make it look as if it were. Basically, it boils down to a few different scenarios. Robbery gone wrong, a random act of violence, a violent stalker or an argument that turned violent and it's impossible from the limited information available to know which it might be. The saddest thing about all of this, of course, is that her daughter witnessed the whole thing, and despite speculation in the newspapers as to whether or not a child psychiatrist would be employed to help coax the memory from the 18-month-old, she remains mercifully unable to remember what happened that day. At the time, Peter Ruffles said... Emily is fine. She's keeping me going, and she's keeping the rest of the family going. As with all these crimes, family members and those who loved Karen are left to live the rest of their lives with the fallout from the crime and the impact it has on everything they do from that point on. Time and time again, in articles spanning an almost 30-year period, the same kinds of sentiment are expressed. Not a day goes by when they do not think of Karen and of what happened. I want to end with a very brief quote. In 2018, simply, the family said, it would mean everything to them to know who killed Karen and why. This episode of Outlines was researched, written, performed and produced by Jess Carter. The music was composed by Elias Hardy.